imagine if each morning when you wake up, you're smiling and looking forward to your day, knowing you are happy even while you're dealing with grief and loss. The Grief and Happiness Podcast inspires, comforts, and supports you with each new episode. I'm Emily Zerothret, welcoming you to explore with me your life of endless possibilities. Aloha. I'm so happy you're here with us today. And I've got a wonderful guest that you're just going to adore listening to and and talking with. She's written so many books and (laughs) they're all good. And she's she's just delightful. And I had a really good experience with one of her books in the car yesterday. So I'll tell you about that too. But and Sue, I forgot to ask you how to say your last name. So could you introduce yourself and and let us know how to say it? (laughs) Okay. My name is Sue, and I well, I write the name with the name Sue Patton Foley. It's holy with the list. Oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> that works. <laughs> yeah, and I'm I'm pretty much a retired emeritus everything now, but loving that, just loving that. I was a psychotherapist for many years, and I was uh, worked in hospice for many years, and I wore a lot of hats in hospice. I, I came in as a crisis counselor, and I did the grief support groups, and I was a just a plain, you know, volunteer visitor for a while, and uh, then I was a chaplain, and um, probably... Well, I loved being a psychotherapist. I just love the intimacy and the honoring that, that that feels like, to be honored to be in presence with people so deeply. Uh, but I've really loved the hospice work, too. And, and I think it's held me in good stead. Uh, did a little work with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And uh, actually, um, the first time I met Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, it was in Maui. It was on Maui. Oh. And and, uh, I was living in California at the time. And then I brought her to California a couple of times to to uh, do some workshops. And now I'm 83 years old. I love being older. I I find it so freeing. And um, I I don't know what else to say. I have a (laughs) doggy. I call her Susie's Folly because I I (laughs) adopted her or I. She was just a puppy when I was 80. And uh, people kind of went, you're getting a puppy? <laughs> it was during COVID and, you know, you had to get a puppy if you wanted somebody little. Mm. Um, so I don't know really what. I have four kids and a, a hubby. And uh, that's that's about it for now. Well, well that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. A whole oh, lot and writing, writing was a surprise. I didn't plan to do that. And I was, my partner and I were, uh, my business partner and I were leading a group for women and we called it Beyond Cinderella. And all of a sudden, when I realized that we'd been doing it for a couple of years, different groups, and I realized that what I noticed is that no matter what the women's circumstances were, whether they were stay at home or they were career people or they were single or married or or whatever, young or old, that they had in in common the very difficult process of being true to themselves and being themselves. And so I just got the muse just took hold of me and I, I literally had to write a book that was entitled The Courage to Be Yourself. And so that was my first one. And then Doing that, we self-published that, and then it was picked up uh, by a publisher, and and I got the bug, and I just kept writing because I was in practice at that time, so there were lots of stories to be told and lots of learning to be shared. Yeah, that's wonderful. You you have a beautiful writing style. I I really in, enjoy it. Your book, I've only done one so far. I was listening to it. Well, tell me about the car. Oh, the car. <laughs> well, I I have a um, 
new book that I've written that's coming out in July, on July 7th. And I'm I'm doing a lot of stuff online, getting ready for that. And one of the things that I was doing was updating my website. And I've got one website that I've got somebody who does everything for us. But I've got another one that that I just really enjoy doing, putting this stuff on the website myself. But they've gotten so much with this AI stuff now, the artificial yeah. intelligence, mm-hmm. that it's it's a challenge now and i had been i had a doctor's appointment yesterday afternoon and i had been working all day long on one thing that should have taken me 5 minutes because i would i had to ask a question about what i was doing cuz there there's just some things you can't figure out somebody's got to tell you what they are and so i and they've got to really with the company that i work with they have a really good chat thing where you can work with people who can help you out really quickly but they've changed it now so that you have to go through this whole series of questions first with the ai before that you can talk to a person and they they kept asking me questions and i would reply to the question whatever it was that the the ai asked me (laughs) and i would reply to it with an answer to the question that was the answer to the question and they'd go we don't understand it can you please say it a different way Oh, golly. And I was doing that over and over. And I was writing, trying to take the same answer and twist it all these different ways to make it so that they would understand what it, it was. And finally, I just got really exasperated. And I, I don't find myself getting exasperated hardly at all. That mm-hmm. just, I kind of left that behind from when I was younger. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> just not that worth it now. And, but I was feeling that way yesterday. It was, it was really frustrating me. And finally, I said, I want to talk to a person. And they said, oh, well, we can go to a person right away. And they did. And I thought, oh, why didn't they say that to start off with? <laughs> it was just driving me nuts. And I still was, when I got in the car to, to drive to my appointment, I was still kind of just a little bit uptight. So I like to to listen to books when I'm in the car. It, it, that way, I, I don't feel like I'm wasting my time, and I, 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 it's peaceful. You know, nobody's calling me on the phone or trying to talk to me or something. I can just listen to whatever it was. And I was listening to the mindful woman, and there were suggestions that you were making about breathing and doing other things that were really calming. And and you know, I I just said. I am so glad that I'm listening to this right now because I was so uptight when I got in the car and I feel really good now. I've been taking some nice <laughs> breaths and I've been doing whatever Sue tells me to do. And <laughs> it just felt so good. Good. <laughs> good. That's cute. So that was my experience. <laughs> good. So hmm, well. I didn't notice that any of your books were specifically on grief or on happiness. It seems like what you're writing about can kind of intertwine with both subjects in most of your books. Well, I, I mostly, mine, mine are, um, a lot of them are the daily things, not, I don't do it daily, but they're little blurbs. And, and I almost always, possibly always weave in grieving because it's just such a natural thing that we all do. And I, I, I've already told you, but I'm going to tell it again because it's so fun. I, I love to open books, my own included, to, and just, just say beforehand, I'd like to a turn to something that's fitting and, and uh, meaningful for right now. And this was right before we tuned in with each other. And I just at random opened my latest book, which is The Courage or The Woman's Book of Strength. And the what I, I call them blurbs, but the little section was imbuing pain with purpose. And it's basically, I believe that we can do that. And when when we have grief and we have pain, like the story I have in here is, is about my children, but I'll tell you something else before I tell you that. When I went through my divorce, I was I was young and I was sort of new to the the um, spiritual paths that that really fit for me. I mean, I'd always gone to church and stuff, but, and I just, I was fortunate to have a spiritual mother who was with me throughout the entire time. It wasn't, it wasn't something I wanted. No, 
anybody in my family had ever been divorced. It was a crushing thing, a failure, in my opinion, uh, then. Turned out to be the best thing in the world, of course, as it often does. But but the grief of that combined with the shame of it. And I think that so often if we're grieving failures or even if we're grieving deaths, there's there can be that shame and that self-recrimination that we heap on ourselves. We didn't do it right. We weren't good enough, blah, blah, blah. When I decided to ask that what I was going through would would be like cutting down the weeds in a jungle so to leave a path because in those day, in that day and age that was a long long time ago there'd never been a divorce in my family and so the the path was pretty overgrown <laughs> so but when I gave it that purpose it it just helped it felt like the the agony and the the lessons had a bigger purpose than just me surviving and 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 it led me to being a therapist which you know was was just something that was so such a great fit for me so and then I, when my kids were old older teenagers within a week of each other they had life changing accidents and illnesses mm. and i was decimated i mean it changed their their futures completely and so i decided that i would hold i would i would think of myself as a container and the 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 agony that i could we can we feel so deeply for our kids when they're in trauma and especially when it's life changing trauma and dream shattering trauma which it was for both of them i decided that if i could i could do hold myself as a container and a and a learner for just more than myself for mothers and and you know who knows what what really happens in that but just holding the intention for that really helped me um helped me feel there was a purpose and and there and I could learn from what I was experiencing to be with people and to empathize and I I really believe that there is a serious serious lack of empathy in in, in the world and in our lives and when we can provide that for somebody, but we may never say a word, and and that's so true in grieving. Uh, my my youngest son was in a hard spot the other day, and we were we had taken a motorcycle ride, and um, and we, I know it was so much fun. I love that. And we were just sitting at lunch in an outdoor venue, and he said, "I I need to vent a little." All I did was touch him and listen. And, you know, a little tear, a little couple of little tears, because I, I got it. And and I think that was helpful. I think I know, I know that when people do that for me, that's helpful. So I just considered that little and an, little angelic visitation. And I, I love whenever those happen, because they, they happen a lot if we're looking for them. Yes. Yeah, it's it's that paying attention thing. It yes, it is. <laughs> oh, okay, there's another Hawaiian story. Okay, when I lived in Hawaii, I was taking, I was taking lessons from a kahuna, and who has since uh, died. But I asked him when I was about to move to the mainland. I said, um, "So Abraham, can you can you just sum up your teachings in a short?" He said, yeah, two words, pay attention. Uh, <laughs> I've beautiful. never forgotten that. Oh, yeah, that's mm -hmm. that's wonderful. I need to remember that one, too. Yeah. It, it makes all the difference in the world. We, A lot of us find ourselves spending time just try, thinking about what we're going to say in response to what somebody's saying instead of listening to what they're saying. And it just, I, I learned so much when I can just be quiet. 
Mm-hmm. And sometimes, especially in grief, you don't need to talk at all. Neither one of you, who, whoever you're with, mm-hmm. need to talk. You can just be in each other's presence and it's enough. Mm-hmm. And, and when we can learn that, it's a beautiful thing. Yesterday was the ninth anniversary of a dear, dear friend's death. And I was um, blessed, truly, to go from diagnosis through death and actually be with her when she died. And I cannot, I, we just used to do that. We just used to, and of course, during the, the last day or so, that's just all we did. Mm-hmm. Sometimes she loved it. She she used to sit next to me at church, and I, I learned a, a while back uh, to recite the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic. And uh, so I would do it quietly when we were reciting the Lord's Prayer in the church I went to then. And she is a minister, and uh, and she just loved that. So I did a lot of that, but but mostly it was just holding her hand and being there it was such an incredible blessing. I mean, a We've blessing had lots and, and, and lots a gift. Of experiences with that. Yeah, yeah. I I have too, and it's it's profound when you can do that, and you. It's it's selfless. When when I'm having that kind of an experience, I'm not I'm not thinking about me. My whole heart's going toward them. Mm-hmm. And whatever support they need at that moment, and it's it's really quite beautiful. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, I we were talking a little bit about purpose, and I I know I after I've I've, I've lived a, a busy life, mm-hmm. you know I've done a yes. lot of things, mm-hmm. and in doing that I I didn't really take a lot of time to contemplate things like purpose. I was just doing what I wanted to do because I wanted to do it and it was positive and productive. And so I I didn't really think beyond that. Mm -hmm. But after Ron died, we'd only been here on Maui for two years and I was just kind of sitting by myself and going, okay, now what do I do? You know, I'm I'm not going to get married again doing this two times. (laughs) Right. Both husbands were sick for two years before they died and both of them died of the same thing. And wow. the second one wasn't sick when I, I married him. So it wasn't right. like I, I chose somebody that had the same thing. And I just, I thought I, that I, I'm not going to do that again. So now what am I going to do? Because I'd been married my whole life mm-hmm. and just didn't know what I was going to do. And so that, that was what I started to contemplate was what my purpose was. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and the more I thought about that, whatever I did, I was choosing to do was purpose. It wasn't random like kind of the rest of my life had been. Not that it was the rest of my life was bad. It just uh, wasn't thoughtful so much. Mm -hmm. And the more I paid attention to choices that I was making and things that I did was really powerful for me. And it, it really shifted my perspective on life. And when I tell people now that I'm happier than I ever have been, and they go, you had two husbands die. How could you be happier than you ever have been? And it's because I'm living right now, you know, and they're they're not here now, uh, in you know, in physical form. It's it's me, and I'm taking care of myself, mm-hmm. and I'm taking care of others however I can on the way, and it feels really good, and I'm enjoying feeling mm-hmm. good about what I'm doing, and it's it's really nice to take the time to find the pleasure in what you choose to do. I love um, in reading your book, um, the one that loving and living your way through grief. I loved how much you uh, emphasized being gentle with yourself and really paying attention to what was right and heart centered for you right now. And I'm I'm using the big you. Mm -hmm. And a long time ago, I came up with the motto, live gently with yourself and others. And I think that one of the things that I really appreciate you doing is is moving that out into a large audience because it's just crucial, really is crucial. We are 
I, I happen to believe that we are born to be us, mm-hmm. <laughs> to, to be us and bring our gifts and um, to heal us and and in the process maybe create an atmosphere in which others can heal more readily. So, yeah, so, so thank you for that. I, that was very noticeable to me. You're uh, you're very welcome because it, it's it's really what I believe, mm-hmm. and you know based on experience and seeing that it it really does work. And one of the questions I often get from people, especially in real early grief, is, "What am I supposed to do?" Mm-hmm. You know, I I just don't know what to do. I up until that point they knew what they were supposed to do or thought they did, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I always say the first thing that you need to do is to take care of yourself. Mm-hmm. Good for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is so hard because in times of early grief, you've probably been a caretaker at least for a while. Yeah. yeah. So to to change directions and do that. Plus it it can feel a little naughty. Mm-hmm. Or selfish. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you get used to putting it all out there, you know, giving all you got and mm-hmm feeling depleted and like there's there's nothing left over and maybe going to bed exhausted at night and and not really realizing what's happening as as it's going along and if if you do take that that time to to focus and be positive and and think what's what's good in this moment you know, mm-hmm. with, with everything that's going on around you, it can seem like everything's bad, but you can always find something good in this moment. And when Absolutely. you can do that, it, it supports you so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just actually wrote a haiku about that. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what it is now. I can't, I can't repeat it, but it was <laughs> about that in the moment, there's always love. Mm-hmm. If, if in fact, if in fact, Emily, we believe that. I love your name because oh. when we moved to to California from Hawaii, we we had a ghost named Emily in oh. our house. Yeah, wow. And um, and she she saved my son's life. Oh wow. Um, yeah. The he he was on the in the basement or the floor beside the furnace furnace room, and the furnace caught on fire. Oh, and he. Um, one of the things that she did to get our attention was to beat on the pipes and she woke him up beating on the pipes. Mm. And, and so I I just, when I am with somebody named Emily, I, I just am a wash in gratitude. Oh, (laughs) that's wonderful. I'm, I'm glad Emily could help. (laughs) Oh yes, she did. And then, and then eventually after that, it was like, that was her purpose, I guess. And she was, we were able to help her move on. Mm, that's really something. There's it, there's so much in, in names. I know when, when I wrote my first college textbook, I was teaching in the English department at the time. And when the publisher found out my name was Emily Thoreau, they said, that's a perfect author's name. <laughs> we had to give you a book contract so that we could have Emily Thoreau write for us. <laughs> and, and is it treat or three? Threat. 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 Mm-hmm. Oh wow! Okay, yeah, and yeah you do have a great name. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say it was pronounced Thoreau, but I wasn't sure. So yeah, well, and my uh, husband's father was French, and they don't wow. pronounce it Thoreau there. But my husband was a philosopher, and <laughs> they he wanted it like Henry David. Uh, so yes, of course. <laughs> we we always said Henry David just didn't know how to spell, but. <laughs> Uh, one thing you mentioned about Elizabeth Kubler Ross. Um, yes. My husband Jacques was a bioethicist, and his specialty was living and dying. Mm-hmm. And it was early in the days of when hospice was becoming a thing. Right. And so he went to England to do a sabbatical where Dame Cecily Saunders was. 
And then he he met Elizabeth Kubler Ross, and when he came back, he he brought her to California to oh. do a presentation and to uh-huh. help him get a hospice established where he lived because mm-hmm. there, there wasn't a hospice there at the time. So I thought when you were telling him yes. about that, I thought, wow, mm-hmm. that that's close. <laughs> yeah, yeah, around about what time that was that? That was in the seventies. I'm not mm-hmm. sure exactly when, because it was long before I met him. It's probably it's, late seventies. I think she was probably coming into her own in the late seventies. You know? Yeah, that's when I met I, her. I think that's that's when it would be. She was a character. That's what he said. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yes. He, he went to uh, pick her up at the airport in Los Angeles, which was a couple hours away from where he lived. And he, right. he said it was he was so glad that he did that because it was such an experience to get to talk she to probably her. She probably smoked in his car. Time. Probably. <laughs> she did. She smoked. Yep. She said, I give my life for other people. I'm going to smoke wherever I want. <laughs> okay. <laughs> would you mind opening the window? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, shoot. Yeah. She was a character. Well, That's funny. And she did an amazing job, just an amazing, amazing, amazing light, but a character. Yeah, yeah, I know she she influenced him a lot because he yeah. he he taught this class that was uh, the ethics of living and dying that all the nursing students had to take in the college where he taught. Mm-hmm. And it got to be the only class that he was teaching because he had so many nursing students. <laughs> Yeah. And he 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 based it initially using her work on the the now I can't say her her big first book, but he he based it around the stages. That. Is that what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 And and he he went on from that, but that's that's what the, the core of what he started off with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I I had the privilege of um, going uh, to a, on a hospital visit with her. Mm-hmm. And um, so I saw it was amazing, uh, her energy. We, we were in the car. She was smoking. And there were a couple of people in the back. And and uh, mm-hmm. and we, we were walking down. The, she and I just she wanted me to go in. She, we were going to be visiting a, a quadriplegic young woman that she was in communication with. And we and she was just talking, you know, kind of grumpy and and opened the door and a different person was there. She, her energy turned almost angelic, Emily. Wow. Oh my God. And she just came over and she just exuded this energy of compassion and caring. And and at that particular time in my life, I was kind of scared of people who were really sick. I mean, it was really uncomfy to me. And she said, would you um, put some Vaseline on so-and-so's lips, please, Sue? And it was just like the exact thing that I didn't want to do. But it was it was something that helped me move past that, that whatever it was I had. I heard that. And, and then we stayed, I don't know, half hour, something like that, maybe. Walked out into the hall. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was just just really just like a, a, a it just changed it was yeah bizarre i you know i i think that that's something that that happens with people who get into that sort of work i i know my husband was people considered him pretty serious because of the kind of work that he did and when when he wasn't at the university, we were doing theater, and he was being in comedies and singing and dancing <laughs> on stage. And the, the, the people that, that thought of the serious man had come to the theater and go, uh-huh. "Is that him?" Because <laughs> it was it was so not what they expected. But it's there's only it's, you, I think you can only give and and do that kind of work at a deep level if it like we were just talking about if you take care of yourself if there's something you do for you too and if if it was it was her cigarettes and my husband's singing voice you know that that was yeah. that was what mm-hmm. worked for them yeah 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 but, well elizabeth was fun too though mm-hmm. so but uh but she was a character for sure yeah oh that's funny 
Well, I could talk to you all day, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I could talk to you all day, yes. Oh, good. Well, fun. we'll have to just talk. <laughs> we'll have touch. to come just to talk. Maui. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Be happy. <laughs> Although I live there. in Colorado, and that's nice also. But Well, yeah, it's pretty beautiful there, but it, you can't beat Maui. <laughs> I've been a no, lot of places, I, I, and I there's just agree. nothing like Maui. I spent um, my honeymoon up in Haleakala. Oh, uh, <laughs> I, I came to Hawaii for my honeymoon. We were on Sugar Beach, though. Mm-hmm. And it, uh, but we lived on Oahu at the time. So. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's amazing to live on on Haleakala. It's it's interesting. I, I mentioned the, the the volcano on the Big yes. Island blew yesterday, yes. and boy, the the pictures were just astonishing what they looked like. And people from the mainland are like, "Are you all right?" And it's, <laughs> yeah, that's another island. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes, we're all in Hawaii, but that's another island. It's not erupting. Right. And they said, "Well, we knew you lived on a volcano," and I thought, "Well." It's like living on the side of a mountain. It's not like, you know, that there's lava right. flowing into my backyard. So <laughs> it's all, all perception, I think. Yeah. One of the things that I, I just struck me about grief is I, because I did a lot of grief workshops and uh, a lot of groups that lasted six and eight weeks and so forth for hospice. And what I noticed is that grief when it's allowed, heals itself pretty naturally and organically. And what I also noticed is that grief can be like an incubator for compassion. It seems like it just can open you when you're really doing your grieving and allowing your grieving. I think it just opens your heart exponentially. I totally agree with that. I bet. And the people that can allow themselves that privilege of that experience mm-hmm. do so much better than the people that do whatever they can to stuff it and, and not think about it and just go on and not let it bother them. Well, if they, they think that, it bothers them that much more than it, it would have otherwise. And it doesn't make it any the less messy. Have uh-uh. you seen that child's book, Grief is Messy? No, but I'm going to. Yeah, it's it's a very sweet book. Uh, But and it is messy. And I think I think the other thing that I have found in my own grieving and in other people's grieving is that it's so profound that we're really frightened it will overtake us. Mm -hmm. And the way that it's most likely to overtake us if is if we do deny it Mm -hmm. or not work through it. So. I, my mother was a real good example of that. And she was just so, she was wonderful. I adored her and I was lucky to have her. But but she was stoic mm-hmm. and uh, had a lot of grief in her life and, and a lot of illness. And I pretty much think that that was probably at least a contributing factor, the fact that she oh, depressed yeah. so much energy. I, I know with, with my mom, um, my mom and dad were on the road a lot with uh, the organization that they worked with. They were always going places. And in those days, you drove. Mom wouldn't fly any place. And so they, mm-hmm. they drove a lot. Mm-hmm. And mom had told me that she was just sure that she and dad were going to die in a car accident at, the, oh. at the same time. She just knew that was going to They witnessed, because they were driving so much, they had witnessed really bad accidents. And they just she just had that in her head. And when dad died suddenly and she didn't get to die with him, she didn't know what to do because that wasn't her plan. And she spent the rest of her life really not smiling and not talking about it, not not dealing with it, not, you know, working on it or anything. She just was not happy. And it it broke my heart. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would do whatever I could to get some some smiles or an occasional laugh or something, and it, it usually didn't work. It, it wasn't until she realized that that uh, she had a brain tumor that when mm-hmm. I got to tell her that, the mm-hmm. chicken doctor, that she kind of fell apart when I told her. But after that, she started to smile again and, and mm-hmm. laugh again. And, and my husband, Jacques, could just crack her up, and he hadn't been able to do that before. But they mm-hmm. did get to laughing together, and mm-hmm. it was like she – 
she gave herself permission finally to know that she wasn't going to just have to sit there and be lonely for forever, mm. that, that that was going to come to an end. Mm. So it, it really made me observe other people. And when I, I see people going that kind of direction, I, I try to do what I can to see that. And it's why I work with grief and happiness yes. because that's so essential to, to live. Happiness is a part of life. And, and when you block that out, you get sick, you uh, are miserable, and it, it just, why live like that? I think also what we don't, we can't do, we can't, if we're unhappy, we can't really be the light that we're, that's we're right. called to be. Absolutely. That's, that's a, a good way to put it. Well, we've talked a lot longer than I expected us to. But <laughs> as I said before, we could talk forever. <laughs> we could. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'm so grateful for you being my guest today, and I'm I'm sure that you've given people a lot to think about and and a lot of books to read. So, <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. It was fun. I really enjoyed it, Emily. Thank you. Yeah, I did too. And for our our guests, we will put in the show notes for this podcast a list of books, <laughs> so you can choose okay. which ones you want to read and, and uh, more contact information about Sue. And I'm sure that you'll, you'll want to keep up with her and see what she's doing because she's quite a light in the world. So mm, Thank you. Thank you're you. welcome. As are you. Oh, thank you. And uh, I'll see our guest next week when we have another great guest that you're going to enjoy. So thank you so much for joining us today. Do you want more comfort, support, and happiness? Join the Grief and Happiness Alliance. Visit my website at lovingandlivingyourwaythroughgrief.com and read my book, Loving and Living Your Way Through Grief. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast, rate it, review it, and binge on all our episodes on grief and happiness. I can't wait to welcome you back to another episode.